peut désormais dire qu'il existe une tradition de canular académique. Le dernier en date a été publié il y a seulement quelques jours. Ces deux auteurs, James Lindsay et Peter Bogosian, ont rédigé un article volontairement ridicule dans lequel ils affirmaient que le pénis humain doit être compris comme une construction sociale, à l'origine de nombreux maux qui accablent l'humanité. Leur but était de se moquer d'un certain type d'études de genre, ou gender studies, qu'ils pensent à la fois ridicule et profondément idéologique. Leur canular a été publié dans un journal mineur, qui fonctionne en open access et qui fait payer les auteurs. Qu'est-ce que la publication de cet article signifie, d'une part à propos de la publication scientifique, et d'autre part pour les gender studies J'interroge James Lindsay, l'un des deux auteurs du canular, à ce propos. There is now a bit of a tradition of academic hoaxes. The latest to date was published only a few days ago. Its two authors, James Lindsay and Peter Bogosian, wrote up a purposefully ridiculous article wherein they claim that the human penis should be understood as a social construct on which many of the evils of Earth may be blamed. Their goal was to make fun of a certain type of postmodern gender studies scholarship that they see as ridiculous, yet deeply ideological. The hoax article was published in a minor journal, functioning on the open access pay-to-publish model. What does the publication of this article mean? What does it mean for scientific publishing? What does it mean for gender studies? I discussed these questions with my guest, Peter Lindsay, one of the authors of the hoax. So hi everyone, I am thrilled to be here with Dr. James Lindsay. Uh, Dr. Lindsay, you're a doctor in mathematics. You are the author of several books, including God Doesn't We Do, published in 2012, and Everybody is Wrong About God, published in 2015. Uh, but today we'll be talking about the fake article that you managed to get published a few days ago with your partner in crime, so to say, Peter Bogosian. Okay, great. Yes, so the paper is called The Conceptual Penis as a Social Construct, and it was published in the journal Coach and Social Sciences. And of course, the whole point is that there was no, nothing cogent about your, your paper. Uh, hmm. Some people have react, reacted quite critically to your hoax. Very. Uh, yes, and they have argued that you failed to demonstrate much except already well-known problems around scientific publishing. Sure. So I will give you an opportunity here to address uh, some of the criticisms that have been formulated. Okay. Yes. So the, the main one, I would, I would say, the main criticism that you have faced is um, that anyone could essentially have published anything in this journal. It's a bad journal, and uh, you were being very naive to believe their claims to be committed to rigorous peer review. So essentially, what I have read some, in some places that you paid to have this paper published and then you turned around to say that you had fooled those people, but actually you had given them your money to publish this paper. So that's not quite right. What happened was that the journal is open access, therefore has a economic model that, that requires authors to pay. Whether that makes it predatory or vanity is difficult to determine. It may be true, but many journals require payment, especially open access. Yes. So we agreed to pay. Mm -hmm. I agreed to pay the journal. They went through the entire process. They sent an email uh, Thursday of last week saying that they were preparing our invoice. Mm -hmm. I figured the invoice would come Friday morning. Nope, they published the paper. I, I assumed that was a mistake. So I had had no invoice given. I could not have paid. We did have an independent party forward the money. We had it in an account ready to pay. We gave the money back once that happened. And they finally sent the invoice on Monday. Mm -hmm. And then within about an hour realized that they had been hoaxed. And because journalists had been reaching out to them, I reached out to them. They realized they had been hoaxed. And they said to obviously, it said obviously in the email, there will be, the, the fee will be waived. Yes. You don't have to pay. So we weren't intending to ha ha trick anybody with the money or be unethical with that. It appears to have been in, and maybe in, in, to word it that way, fortunate, uh, fortunate accidents that led to that circumstance. So it is true that the journal does require a minimum payment. 
I have no idea why our minimum payment was set to be six hundred and twenty-five dollars. It was it's considerably less than their stated minimum payment, but that's what they asked me to agree to, and I agreed to it. Then, as the story proceeded, it, you you've now heard it. Okay, but to, to the claim that um, it is a, a journal in which anyone could have published anything because you know it's sure 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 it's uh, not really peer reviewed in any. In a real way, and it's it's just essentially a paper published model. So some people so, will insist yeah, on like, that. I think there may be validity to that claim. I don't know. I invite other people to try. Mm-hmm. To be honest with you, um, once we agreed between the two of us to go with a pay to publish open access journal, we realized that this was going to be the problem. Yes. That there would be now two variables that might influence it being accepted versus just one variable. Um, Personally, I think the paper's so ridiculous it had no hope of being published anywhere unless I (laughs) turned down the ridiculousness by at least a quarter. I do think if I had made it a little more serious, and it turns out longer, most journals require in the the field seem to require longer papers than what we wrote. Um, I think maybe it's highly likely it could have made it under the radar, but and people keep saying, well, why didn't you do that? Why didn't you do that? Well, here's what happened. They transferred it. We said, what do you say? Do you want to try this? Here's how it muddies the water. We decided that it's possible that we might draw attention to this problem either instead or at the same time, mm-hmm. as we wrote in Skeptic, that there is a two, two-part two problem we're looking at. And this is also another academic problem. So we, we, we went with it. And then it's sort of like once the ball started rolling, the ball was rolling. I still didn't think the journal would accept it. And then the journal did accept it. And so we just said, OK, let's run with this and see where it goes. Apparently where it goes is a lot of people jumping to conclusions that I can't quite reach mm-hmm. to, to, to say really cruel things about our intentions that don't actually match our intentions. But... I mean, I will admit our initial intention was to hoax gender studies. But yes. once we once we agreed to use this journal, our as we wrote in, in Skeptic, our our intention had to take two two variables into account, not one. Mm-hmm. Thus, um, what we're mostly being accused of is that we are to to actually read from from the blog you mentioned in the email, the Bleeding Heart Libertarians. Yes. It says, from this, they're claiming that the entire field of gender studies is crippled academically, this is our quote, is crippled academically by an overriding, almost religious belief that maleness is the root of all evil. (laughs) No, 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 no. We don't claim that based on our hoax, that's the case. Yes. We believe that to be the case independently of our hoax. That's why we hoaxed. Mm Mm-hmm. So we are not basing that conclusion on our hoax, which is what we're widely being accused of. We believe that in the first place and sought to try to find some evidence of it. Yes. Whether we have or not is is questionable. So I invite your listeners, I invite anybody who hears this, please mm-hmm. go try to hoax another one. There are lots of open access journals, as many people have documented, that have been hoaxed. So maybe that is the problem. If they can hoax social uh, cogent social sciences or any of the cogent journals again, then over time as evidence accumulates, we will happily concede that what we pointed at is the problem of the open access journal. That doesn't necessarily necessarily invalidate our concerns about gender studies, however, mm-hmm. which preceded and are not based upon our hoax as far as our, our suspicions. In Skeptic, when we worded this carefully, we said on the evidence, and I quote, our suspicion is justified. We are sus- we, we hold gender studies in suspicion. We feel that our suspicion is still justified. So that's a that's a far cry from saying, ha ha, take that gender studies. Yeah. So in, in this case, uh, some people I've seen this um, this criticism and I think well I, I, I'm not sure what to what to think of it, but um, some people say that it, it would have made much more sense if besides the hooks uh, the hoax paper you had written, um, you know, a, a longer explanation and, and a critical text on gender studies where you examine maybe some of the literature to explain why you, why you hold uh, gender studies, why you have some suspicions uh, about gender studies independently sure. of the hoax. Sure, and there's there's ample opportunity in the future to do that as well. And it's not that this is a undocumented territory. I mean, I could link you to a, a dozen articles about it that already exist that are quite good. 
with with no effort. Mm -hmm. And so there's an opportunity to, to do that still. And perhaps we may. But if you've read the skeptic piece, you've noticed that it's quite long. It's Three, over 3,000 words. And I don't know if you've tried to publish things in magazines before, <laughs> but to get anything published over 1,200 or 1,000 words is nearly impossible. So why isn't it longer? I mean, okay, you go publish a 6,000-word essay in a magazine. Please give it a try. See how many people read it. We're having reading comprehension problems as it is with the one with, that we published. If we'd made it longer, the T, what is it, too long, didn't read TLDR crowd <laughs> is, is going to miss even more. So... Why didn't we make it longer? I mean, it, it, the story tells itself. Okay. Okay. So I think it might help, but I, I, I'm, I don't know if you're in a position to do that, but I, uh, if you allow, so to say, to do that, but I think it might help if you could explain on what grounds the initial journal, I mean, the journal to which you initially uh, submitted the paper rejected this manuscript. They issued no explanation whatsoever. So I, I would be ch glad to share that. But what I've experienced in um, submitting different papers at different times is that sometimes journals are quite forthcoming with those reasons and sometimes they aren't. In this case, they gave literally no reasons. They had a space for it designated in the email. It said reviewer comments, colon, blank space, nothing written there. Mm -hmm. So... There was absolutely no explanation given. Now, as of this morning, the journal Cogent has published an explanation, and they said that they rejected it. Now, of course, at this point, they've got to, to cover themselves as well, but they said that the original journal deemed it unsound, and they accidentally offered to internally transfer it. Mm -hmm. That may be true. I don't know. I can't accuse people, A, so let me talk about that briefly. I can't accuse Taylor and Francis of running a racket mm -hmm. to try to make money by taking dubious quality papers and shuttling them to vanity journals that they also profit from. Yeah. That, I can't accuse them of that. I have no solid enough evidence for that accusation. Secondly, I can't accuse Cogent of being merely a predatory vanity journal. As much as I might be tempted to based on some of the evidence, I don't have the evidence to do that. And I might add that my attorney told me it's not a good idea to do so <laughs> because it constitutes libel to accuse them of something damaging that I can't prove. So, I mean, in that case, I would urge these people who are jumping to the conclusion that I can't make, even though it may be, it may be borne out by the apparent evidence, which I don't deny, yeah. not to make that accusation because it's – very concerning to, to jump to, I mean, this is a big trend that we're seeing in, in these communities as well often is to jump to these conclusions that have legal ramifications on evidence that doesn't match with what we consider to be legal due process. Mm -hmm. I see. So you, you, to return to the, to the, the, the first journal, you, you, you don't know if uh, it was rejected by the editor or by some reviewer. It was rejected by the editor. By the editor, okay. Yes. So they as did not send know, it for review. It didn't. The first journal did not send it for review. I see. Right. The second journal sent it for review, and the uh, editor that it finally approved it is a professor at a university. He's not necessarily a professor of gender studies, apparently, but he is still a professor at a university. And as we wrote in Skeptic, any academics should have been able to, even lay people should be able to see through this paper. Yeah. This, of course, lends credence to the belief. Lends credence, of course, is different from proofs, just like hoaxes don't prove that gender, the, the fields are corrupt. They mm -hmm. just draw attention to the possibility that something's going on there. But this lends credence, certainly, to the belief that the journal has a compromised peer review system. Whether that's because they're amateur or because they have ulterior financial motives is something that I can't make a determination on because I don't have that evidence. I see. Okay. Um, well, I think we've already more or less covered my, my main, main questions because I had prepared a question. I've seen the claim and you've seen it uh, as well, of course, that uh, made by some people that you were yourself claiming that you had some somehow disqualified the entire field of gender studies, but of course you 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 have clarified that that is not the case. I mean, that, that might have been like the motivating idea to start the hoax, but mm -hmm. I mean, 
I have a training, a background in science and a background in mathematics. As you said, I taught statistics I, at the university. I'm fully aware that as so many people have, cogent, have kindly pointed out to me that a data set of N equals one doesn't. Of course, that's why we didn't claim we invalidated it. Yes. What our expectation is, is where there's a lot of smoke, there might be fire. And if you look, you might find it. Gender studies has produce, produced enough peer-reviewed literature that is ostensibly not hoaxes mm -hmm. to where there are many people, A, arguing on our behalf that our paper is largely indistinguishable from some of the things that are being published, yes. and B, much more alarming, that we serendipitously made a cogent argument in the gender studies. There are people that are proponents of gender studies saying that, oh, look, well, they didn't mean to. They're, the author is dead. They're monkeys at a keyboard. Mm -hmm. But they have made an important point. Penises are social constructs that cause damaging things to happen in society. And so given that subsequent evidence, we can start to draw conclusions that maybe there are internal systematic problems within the field of gender studies. But again, that's just preliminary suggestive evidence. And as I've said on several podcasts now, and I've said on Twitter now, all this demands is a closer look Mm. by gender scholars and other social scientists and other scholars into the rigor of gender studies. Perhaps it's been flying under the radar because it's a niche field. I don't know. But all this does is draw attention. And I'd like to let me make one comment about that also. I've heard the criticism that hundreds of science open access journals have been have been hoaxed similarly. And yes. nobody said science is false. Well, there are a number of reasons for that, but I'm only going to talk about one thing. The one thing is hundreds of science journals have been hoaxed with completely bogus random text papers and so on and so forth. Hundreds of them. This should be a gigantic outrage. This should have gi generated attention on the open access problem that it clearly hasn't. Yeah. We have generated, even if it wasn't our initial goal, once we decided to, to run with the open access journal variable, we have now generated by means of the political controversy that runs with it and a misreading of our of our skeptic piece, mm -hmm. we have generated way more attention on this academic problem than than the, the open access problem than perhaps we intended to. And um that should be good if that's tightening up academic standards overall. And it, if it turns out that we can conclude eventually that the journal is merely vanity, merely pay to publish, because many journals require pay to publish, yeah. um, especially open access journals. If it is merely vanity, it's excellent that we drew high profile attention to that problem. Uh, if gender studies has its entire house in order, which hopefully they do, the additional scrutiny on gender studies will vindicate that, and mm -hmm. it's good for everybody. If they happen not to have their house in order, as we suspect, then that's another conversation to have that we should be having. Okay. So I don't see how what we've done is constitutes anything like what our critics are trying to accuse us of. The only fraud was in pretending we were writing a serious paper <laughs> and actually not doing so, which is the nature of a satirical hoax in the first place. So that's unavoidable. Yes. Okay. So final question. Uh, so you've mentioned in passing that you could point uh, people to some, um, well, some writings that have maybe criticized gender studies in a more systematic way. So I don't know if you can uh, name a few before, before we, we, we wrap up. Well, there's a magazine that has recently come. It's fairly new, recently come out, known as REO Magazine. A-R-E-O magazine. And there are a handful of pieces in there. I'll point to one. I don't have the titles in front of me. One that came out today by a, by a psychologist named Clay Rutledge. And mm -hmm. then one by a scholar who used to be a feminist activist named Helen Pluckrose that, that outlined the problems within postmodernism and what's going on on that side of the academy far more. There's also another magazine that... Uh, called Quillette that that you may have seen. Yes. Um, and Quillette also had a wonderful interview recently with Clay Rutledge where he goes into tremendous depth on this problem. And 
So you can you can look for the interview with Clay Rutledge on Quillette, or I can find it and send you a link, and then you can put it, yes. you know, with the podcast. And these these three sources, for instance, jump to mind immediately as just wonderful examples of the the problem. And then there, you can also direct your readers to or listeners, I'm sorry, to look at the the website Heterodox Academy. Mm-hmm. And they are, of course, much more circumspect in their approach and and not quite so uh, direct about it. But they are also doing an excellent job pointing out where these kinds of problems lie. Yes. And so and these are these are scholars. I'm not pointing to YouTube videos. I'm not mm-hmm. pointing to to amateurs. I'm, I'm pointing to scholars. So uh, those those. Those are wonderful resources to to see the problem mm-hmm. from the perspective that we are seeing. And of course, we would encourage everybody, this has been, I guess, wonderful publicity for them to go examine the satirical Twitter feed called at Real Peer Review, yes. which, which publicizes some of these uh, outrageously uh, unbelievable <laughs> studies and, and, and papers being published. That led us to believe, those papers were the ones that led us to believe, to suspect that a hoax would be possible. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes, well, this, uh, yeah, this will be very useful. These resources can be quite helpful, I hope. Uh, sure. Is there a final thing that you might want to add? Yes, actually, I, I, there is. Um, I've, I would like to actually thank the majority of our critics for holding us to a far higher standard than we suspect some of the academic papers themselves are being held to. Okay. That is a sign of health in one aspect of the community and of the, uh, say, the skeptical or rationalist community, if you wanted to identify those, or even within the academic community. The fact that we're being held to such high standards of rigor in terms of, of a, a prank that we pulled and then published an article in a, in a magazine mm-hmm. is a positive sign. And we hope that that same standard of rigor will find its way into examining the two problems that we think that we may have exposed, yes. drawn attention to, not proved, drawn attention to, with having published a hoax. I see. Okay, well, that's a um, very nice message. Uh, well, thanks a lot for agreeing to do this. Um, yeah, uh, I hope we keep learning more things from, from this hoax. I think we will. I hope so too. Yes. Yeah. So well. In the meantime, so thanks again. Thanks again for coming and uh, take care. Thank you very much for having me. So when this is done, let me know and I'll I'll share it. Mm-hmm. Sure. Goodbye. Great. Thank you. Bye.